Hello there, my fellow fans of the Battletech universe, and welcome to a brand new lore video. Since we are, at least from an overview standpoint, finished with the five main successor states of the Inner Sphere, for today I thought about doing something a little different. We are going to talk about a faction, or nation, or alliance, or however you want to call it, that, while gone in the present era Battletech, was so important that it shaped most of the history of the setting. And that faction is known as the Star League. Now, there is enough lore about the Star League to make videos for a whole week, but for today I just wanted to talk a little bit about them in general, a bit of its history and its government. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The brainchild of Ian Cameron, the Star League was a self-policing interstellar council, formed from the Terran hegemony, the great houses of the inner sphere, and the territorial states of the periphery. Each of the states of the Star League was required to provide soldiers and war material for the mutual protection of the Star League Defense Force, or short, the SLDF, but otherwise was allowed to maintain its own standing army and even conduct rare, small-scale wars. Though not entirely stable, the relative peace, prosperity, and advanced technology of the Star League period have led many to consider the Star League as the zenith of human civilization. The first treaties of the Star League were penned by the Terran Hegemony, the Capellan Confederation, and the Free Worlds League in 2556. Following these initial treaties, the Lyran Commonwealth in 2558, the Federated Sons in 2567, and finally the Draconis Combine in 2598 also signed. The Star League was officially born with the July 9, 2571 signing of the Star League Accords by Ian Cameron and the Five House Lords. In one of his first acts, First Lord Ian Cameron appointed his wife, Chandra Noruf Cameron, as Chief of Staff and Commander-in-Chief of the yet-unformed Star League Defense Forces. During Ian's reign, efforts were made to bring the periphery into the League. Through the various bloody battles of the Reunification War, a ceasefire was reached with the Outworlds Alliance in 2585, the Magistracy of Canopus was defeated in 2588, the insurrection in the Rimworld's Republic was extinguished in 2596, and the Torian Concordat was finally defeated in 2596. In 2600, Lady Chandra Noruf Cameron died, followed two years later by Lord Ian. The son of Ian, Nicholas, was then declared leader of the Star League. In 2646, Nicholas Cameron designated Michael Cameron, Joseph's son, as his successor, who assumed power in 2649 upon Nicholas's death. On October 13th, 2690, Michael retired when he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and Jonathan Cameron, his oldest son, was designated his replacement. During his reign, Jonathan engaged in a buildup of SLDF forces. Unstable and unable to rule, Jonathan consulted his sister, Yocasta Cameron, more and more often, with Yocasta in effect becoming the de facto leader of the Star League. In 2738, Jonathan Cameron died of a stroke, and Mother Yocasta handed over the Star League to Jonathan's son, Simon. In 2751, Simon Cameron died, leaving his eight-year-old son, Richard Cameron II, as the only successor. The five lords convened on Terra and appointed General Alexander Kerensky, commanding officer of the Star League Defense Forces, as Richard's regent and protector. Stefan Amaris, ruler of the Rimworld's Republic, slowly began working his way as a airtags, friend of the young Richard, poisoning the thoughts of the young First Lord. 
Before long, Richard began to see Amaris as his best friend and confidant, and Amaris took advantage, convincing Richard to remove all SLDF forces from the Rimworld's Republic, and ordered all SLDF bases and fortresses to be turned over to the Rimworld's Republic. Stefan Amaris continued to expand his influence with Richard, as the houses began skirmishing on the verge of Richard's majority. Convinced by Amaris that Kerensky and the House Lords were all against him, Richard became even more embittered and paranoid. As more and more bases were placed under Republic control, Stefan Amaris proceeded to Terra itself and assassinated Richard and all the remaining members of the Cameron family. This way, he took the power, at least nominally, of the entire Star League. Involved with fighting in the periphery, General Kerensky regrouped and quickly took over the Rimworld's Republic. After some rest, Kerensky divided his forces into three groups, one to travel through each of the accommodating houses towards the hegemony. On January 23rd, 2777, soldiers on eight worlds moved towards Terra and finally captured the planet after a bloody battle with over 100 million dead, on September of 2779. Amaris and his family were soon executed, soon after Kerensky heard of the fate of Richard Cameron and his family. One year later, on the 10th of October, 2780, the Council Lords gathered and stripped Kerensky of his title of Protector, refusing an offer by General de Chevalier to help overthrow the House Lords. Ten months later, the Lords had still not reached a decision on a successor for the position of the First Lord. With everyone claiming the position for him or herself, the council was dissolved by the Lords on August 12, 2781. As the spirit of the Star League began eroding, Kerensky gathered 80% of the SLDF forces and then jumped out of the inner sphere, not to be seen again for almost three centuries, thus completing the collapse of the Star League. This collapse would then cause the Succession Wars, but those are an entirely different story. The leader of the Star League was the First Lord, a hereditary position held by members of House Cameron from the League's inception to its downfall. The First Lord had formidable political, economic, and military power, even over the other great houses, though the Camerons rarely used these powers unilaterally. Their efforts to govern through compromise and consensus endeared them in the general public's eye, which helped the First Lord in implementing policies, even those privately opposed by the other Lords. The High Council was the primary governing body of the Star League, composed of the First Lord and the leaders of the five other great houses, known as the Council Lords. The Council met biannually to discuss and ratify the government budget, summon witnesses to testify on big matters, hear petitions, and address other League concerns, but was restricted from discussing the governance of each other's realm. During a crisis, an emergency meeting would be called, and for a matter of great importance, a Council Directive, or Council Order, would be drafted and put to a vote, with a majority required for passage. The First Lord had the casting vote in the event of a tie. If a matter being discussed involved the periphery, its administrators could attend meetings and participate, but were not given the right to vote. Each Council Lord was also allowed to bring in advisors to Council meetings to assist or even tell the Lords how they should vote. These advisors were often dispatched on fact-finding missions and used their prestige to gain wealth and become nobles. Council meetings were held in the capital city of the Star League. Known unofficially as Unity City, the court of the Star League was built near Puget Sound, located on the North American continent on Terra. It was also the location of the Royal Court, which met for two months during the Spring and Winter Council meetings. Though not an official part of the High Council, 
the royal court was ostensibly a social gathering of nobles, intellectuals, and celebrities, with the festivities led by the first lord's spouse or the master of protocol. It was often during these events that many backroom agreements were forged, such that the royal court gained a reputation for rampant political and economic maneuvering. The titles of nobility were reinstated by Michael Cameron, they served more as job titles within the Star League and Terran hegemony, a distinction purposefully made by the Camerons to prevent the kind of class stratification found in other realms. Towards this end, nobles were never given permanent positions within a planet government. Instead they served at the whim of the public, which could vote them out of office. Dukes and duchesses were at the top of the hierarchy of nobility, and either owned the most land or controlled the most industry on a given planet. A variant of this were the so-called vagabond dukes, owners of major interstellar conglomerates spread over many hegemony worlds. The title of Marques, or Marquesa, was granted to scientists for making great contributions to science. A count, or countess, was the owner of major companies or large pieces of land on a world, with their allegiance often, but not always, tied to the planet's duke. The baron and baroness was the lowest rank of nobility, granted to owners of modest companies or farmlands, or as a reward for excellent service in the SLDF. Some of the greatest political dramas were played out between a planet's duke and their counts or barons, jockeying for control of the government. The vast bureaucracy charged with carrying out the laws and edicts of the League was the so-called Bureau of Star League's Affairs, with its headquarters located in the court of the Star League. This bureau was headed by the commander of the BSLA, whose position was so critical that they were personally elected by the First Lord for loyalty to House Cameron. It was further divided into six departments. Department of Administration, Department of Social Relations, Department of Economic Relations, Department of Revenue, Department of Education and Information, and the Department of the Attorney General. The Department of Administration this was charged with publicizing and enforcing the laws of the High Council. As the first line of defense in a political crisis, administrators were trained in the arts of diplomacy and to show initiative during even the most stressful of situations. State administrators were essentially the Star League's ambassadors to its member states, stationed on each realm's capital planet, and kept in constant contact with their own personal HPG station. In an emergency, every state administrator could call upon the local SLDF commander to undertake military operations to uphold the Star League's laws and legal rights, although their mere presence was normally more than enough to ensure enforcement. In time, five families would come to dominate the role of state administrator in each realm, based upon the family's familiarity with that state's political landscape. House Isu for the Draconis Combine, House Hughes for the Free Worlds League, House Brewer for the Lyran Commonwealth, House Ling for the Capellan Confederation, and House Green for the Federated Sons. The Department of Social Relations the first function of this department was to maintain an open, updated database of political information about the member and territorial states of the Star League. It was hoped that this collection of treaties, agreements, political writings, and other information about the different realms would promote open and honest relations. The second function, saved for when relations did break down, was to activate the so-called political emergency response teams, trained extensively in the art of diplomacy and the background and political system of each realm and their leadership. The Department of Economic Relations This one had the right to judge whether a member state was taking unfair advantage of another state or individual world, 
with guilty offenders facing stiff fines and embargoes. The department also closely supervised commerce between the states, forcing companies to adhere to strict guidelines when shipping products between worlds. Those that didn't comply were barred from major ports accredited by the Star League. Although many who couldn't afford to license their ships still operated illegally on the black market. The Department of Revenue Charged with the thankless and sometimes even dangerous task of collecting taxes, the Department of Revenue was one of the most hated departments of the BSLA. Member states often pay their share, a percentage of their gross national product, along with any other fees incurred with little to no problem. However, collecting taxes from individual planets could prove more difficult, and often the SLDF was called to perform vigorous and public maneuvers to convince AirTag's hesitant planetary governments. Collecting from individuals was by far the most difficult and dangerous job. Revenue agents, known derisively as Cameron's thieves and money grubbers, were charged with running down the most flagrant violators, typically rich businessmen. These special tax collectors were given considerable combat training to perform their duty. The Department of Education and Information this one was created with the goal of maintaining a first-rate education system and providing free information to anyone with access to a computer or a library. Executive Order 4 had been created to promote peace and understanding between the member states, and the department was charged to fulfill that order by training and accrediting teachers from all across the inner sphere. The title of Teacher of the Star League was a highly coveted privilege, especially in places where they were in short supply. And finally, for today, the Department of the Attorney General. This one was charged with capturing and trying anyone accused of breaking Star League law. It was divided into the Attorney General Command and the Judicial Command. The first one was responsible for prosecuting suspects, though it relied heavily on the SLDF to capture them in the first place. Judicial command was in charge of training judges and maintaining the system of courts used to try the suspects. Regional courts handled most criminal cases, while appellate courts revised their decisions and handled political cases between planets and member states. The highest of the courts was the Supreme Court, located in the District of Columbia on Terra. This one handled the cases too important or too complex for the lower courts. It consisted of seven judges, two from the hegemony and one from each member state, and was headed by a chief justice. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Star League a brief overview of its history and its government. I realize it can be a lot to digest in case you're only now getting into Battletech, but as I make more videos surrounding these topics, I will do my best to make it more clear. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Also, if you have any suggestions on what self-contained topics I could cover next, I do welcome any suggestions in the comments below. I have been GDN, and I thank you very much for watching, and wish you all an awesome day.